Welcome everybody to the show. We've got a special guest here today, Mr. Rabrindra Mishra. Uh, he's a Nepali journalist um, and the chief editor of BBC Nepali radio network and the founder of um, the Help Nepal network. Welcome to the show, first of all. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much. It's my privilege to be here in your television and talk to you. <laughs> Mr. Mishra, you are currently traveling through Europe trying to raise funds for your Help Nepal network. Can you tell us something about uh, the goals of your network? Uh, Help Nepal network, one euro a month fund for Nepal. Uh, this is a charity which was established about 12 years ago. And the, uh, the whole idea of the charity was to encourage Nepali people living abroad and living inside Nepal to do more for Nepal. Because the idea was, in most of the third world countries like Nepal, what happens is, you know, somebody starts a non-governmental organization and the people uh, working there or the people who establish, they start seeking funds from international donors and, uh, you know, they write proposals, they get the donations and then, you know, they uh, take salary from the same money and then they run the office from the same money and then they do some work as well. So most of the time we rely on international donors, international donations. But what we thought was first Nepali should have the, uh, the feeling uh, you know, the, in a way, the pat patriotic feeling uh, and should think that we, sh we are responsible first, we need to do first for Nepal, and then if we can't, then obviously, you know, we can seek uh, support from uh, foreigners as well. So what we said was we want to collect money from Nepalis and we want to encourage Nepalis to do something for Nepal from wherever they come, you know, from cities, from villages. And we created a slogan, one euro a month fund for Nepal. In America, it becomes one dollar a month fund for Nepal. The idea was, if you don't have a lot, then give little. If you have more, give slightly more. But you give first before you ask from others. So that is the way we thought and that is how the charity was established. Because most of the time, you know, uh, Nepalis and many of the third world country people, you, you'll see them talking about the country very passionately. They criticize the politicians for not doing things correctly. They criticize the bureaucrats for not doing things correctly. And then if you ask them, okay, you are also a Nepali or you are also a Bangladeshi, you are so passionate about your country's, uh, you know, development, and you think you should, your country should do better. Then, as a citizen, what have you do, done to rectify the wrongs that you are so passionately criticizing? If you ask them, then most of them would have no answers because we seek rights, and then we don't want to be responsible. So the idea of Help Nepal Network was to make Nepalis more responsible towards their country. That was on a philosophical level. Yeah. On the ground level, we said, OK, then we collect money. And what we do, we work in the areas of health and education and disaster relief. So uh, in the beginning, it was very difficult. But then slowly we gain credibility because, you know, initially we put in our own money to do a few works. And then right from the beginning, we separated the charitable fund and the administrative fund. And that is very, very unusual for most of the charities in the world. You know, any big charities you name, they, uh, you know, raise funds. And from that fund, certain per percentage goes towards uh, running the office. But we said, you know, if we start doing that, then it becomes a profession. We don't want to make charity a profession uh, because we want to make it, uh, make it a service, you know, as such. Like, we actually want to transcend our professional boundary and to do things for the society. So right from the beginning, we separated the two, and then whatever people donated, to, you know, build a school or a health post or a library, all the money went towards the project and all the administrative expenses 
we initially we put our own money and run the administration. Later on, we collected funds from uh, 25 Nepalis, and that fund is around um, 175,000 euros or 200. 30,000 U.S. dollars, and uh, it is put in a high-interest account in Nepal. So the interest generated from that fund goes towards running the office, and there were generous Nepalis who donated to that fund. And all other money that we raise for charity directly goes to projects that we do. And we have built around 40 schools, smaller schools so far. We have built around 40 libraries. And then we, we are constructing a huge orphanage uh, in the outskirts of the capital, Kathmandu. And within a year, that will come into operation. And we'll be housing 40 orphans in that uh, in that place, and then we run health posts as well, and we support you know people affected by floods, affected by fire, people suffering from hunger, and then we do all these kind of things, and there are more and more Nepali people who are supporting us. But this support mainly goes to the rural areas or cities as well? No, most of the time it goes to rural areas. Sometimes, you know, we do work in city schools as well, but not the private schools, but the government-run schools, which are in a very, very, um, you know, very, very bad condition. You just said that many Nepalis share a passion for their country and um, criticize politics, government, the, the state of the country, but don't do anything to help. Is that an experience you shared personal, personally? Uh, I think, you know, the, it is not only me, lots of Nepalis and lots of people from the third world countries sh share the similar experiences. Uh, because we are uh, politically very vocal, you know, we can demonstrate on the streets every day, uh, come out on the streets every day, we can throw stones, we can break glasses and we can do all these things. But when we, actually it comes to contributing towards a society, we think that is the responsibility of the government. That is true. But if the citizens aren't responsible, how can government be responsible? Because government is an institution which is made up of citizens, right? And uh, what we also think is, in a country like Nepal, for example, in Germany, the system works. So a citizen, if he fulfills his professional duties sincerely, that will be enough because the system functions. In a country like Nepal, where the system doesn't function properly, citizens have to be more responsible. When the state becomes weak, it is the duty of the citizen to be more responsible. Otherwise, the country will be completely anarchic. It will just fall apart. So you can't blame the government when the, you know that it is very weak. You can try to improve it, but you can't just sit quietly and do nothing and say that it is the responsibility of the government when you actually know that government actually can't even function. So what we say is, yes, you know, government isn't doing things correctly, bureaucrats aren't doing things correctly, but we always say they have to do it correctly and citizens themselves rarely do it. So our point is, OK, things are bad, so transcend your professional boundary, come out of your professional boundary. First thing, you do your, fulfill your responsible, uh, responsibilities properly and sincerely in your profession. Then, apart from that, come out of that boundary and try to do something for the society. So you create a positive atmosphere, positive vibe. So you create responsible citizens. And after 10 years, these are the people who will go into government, who will go into bureaucracy, who will go into judiciary, and they will be more responsible. Otherwise, you criticize the government, you come home, and you be corrupt. You don't be responsible. Nepal is, you know, one of the most corrupt countries in the world, uh, according to Transparency International reports. You know, out of maybe 180, 84 countries that they surveyed last year, Nepal was in 154 number. Mm -hmm. So as people, we might be nice, but we are corrupt as well. And the, the effort at a philosophical level, you know, of this charity is to raise us from that label and make us more responsible towards the society. But if that is the case, um, 
shouldn't people be demonstrating way more right now if you have a if you have a look at the political chaos that is going on in Nepal um, I mean the the country has been um, in political turmoil more the last two or three decades for 10 years civil war then the uh, abolishment of, of uh, the monarchy, 2008, the establishment of a republic, democrat, uh, democratic country. And um, it's been four years now, and there's still no new constitution. Um, what's your opinion on that? I mean, some, uh, something is obviously you know, in not In the beginning working. of the, uh, this question, you say that shouldn't people come out and, you know, demonstrate to g correct these things. We have been demonstrating for years and years. We have been coming out on the streets and demonstrating for years and years. And what have, you, what have we achieved? We have achieved theoretical changes. From monarchy, we became a republic. In a republic, we are trying to be, uh, adopt a federal system, right? And then theoretically, we have changed. Mm -hmm. We have changed regimes. But have we changed the culture, political culture? Have we changed the psyche of the people? Have we changed the mindset of the people? We haven't. Unless and until I change, politics isn't going to change. Only the system will change. The culture will change. So you, can't, you can change the government. You can change the system. You can blame the Maoist. You can blame the monarchist. You can blame the, this party. You can blame that party. But you won't achieve anything. So the whole effort should be geared towards making citizens more responsible before we talk about the corrupt politicians. That is, that is so obvious. I, I'll give you an example. South Korea, you know, in 1960, per capita income of South Korea and Nepal was almost equal. It was about $100 uh, a month, right? In 2012, and then, uh, you know, in 1960, South Korea used to send its laborers to the Gulf states as we do now, as Nepal does now. And South Korea used to import grains, food grains from Nepal in 1960. In 2012, South Korea's per capita income is $20,000 a person, right? And Nepal is under $600. So, I mean, you know, how would you explain this? It is we in Nepal just talked about changing the system, changing the regime, but they actually worked for the development of the, uh, of the country. Mm -hmm. We in Nepal think that, if I'm a communist, I think that only communism can, you know, make the country prosperous. If I'm a Democrat, I think that only democracy will make the country prosperous. If I'm a monarchist, I will think that only monarchy can help, you know, save this country. But I call them, uh, what do you call, principally the blind argument. Mm -hmm. Because there are lots of democratic countries in the world which are doing very well. India is one of the largest it is the largest, uh, it is known as the largest democratic country in the world, and it is, you know, our neighbor. And its economic growth is, you know, between 7 to 10 percent. It is doing well. We have another neighbor, China, which is called a communist country. It has raised, you know, such a huge number of people over the poverty line in the past 20 years that. You know, it is the number of people who were raised over the poverty, li poverty line is bigger than the population of the Europe. Uh, population of Europe, it is doing very well, right? And then you go to the Far East; there are benign dictators ruling the country. They are prospering very well. You come to the Gulf region; they have monarchy, and they are still doing very well. You go, come to you know the UK; it is a meritocratic society, but the monarchy survives. In Germany, you have a presidential system, still you are doing well. So the, the, this, you know, the, what kind of system you have doesn't matter. Any system can function if you can work well, if you can be honest, if you can be sincere to your country. But we in Nepal, 
think that only my ideology will work for this country and no one others will work. And we have been fighting for ideological, uh, fighting the ideological battle for the last several decades. And that is so unfortunate. Otherwise, Nepal has a huge natural resources. Nepal has, you know, the, the natural beauty. Nepal has the Mount Everest. Nepal has the, uh, is the birthplace of Lord Buddha. And there is, you know, it is the center of Hinduism as well. We can bring a lot of Indian tourists into Nepal. And we have all the things that will make a country prosperous. And still we have only, you know, le less than $600 per capita income. So you can't, you can't blame the system. We should take the responsibility because we are the people who will rule the country. You know, it will be my children, my brothers, my sisters will rule the country in the next 10 years. So first, we need to be responsible. That is how I see things. Let's talk about this responsibility a little bit more. You're a journalist, and um, you say you're trying to combine um, your charity work and your job as a journalist, and, and um, you call it philanthropic journalism. Could you tell me something about that? Uh, I'm not trying to uh, mix the two. Hmm. I'm not trying to mix the job and the, the charity work, uh, but over the years, you know, I was a student of journalism, and then I worked in print, I worked in radio, I worked in television, you know, I worked, I mean, uh, in different places. And over the years, I've come to the conclusion uh, that the journalism that the world pra has been practicing for decades is fundamentally flawed. The journalism that we practice and that everyone practices around the world mostly revolves around politics. And that is very natural because politics rules the world, right? But apart from politics, there are lots of other things as well. And we really focus on various other things. We focus mainly on politics. And apart from that, in politics, what we talk, we talk about political wranglings, political fights, um, you know, the regime chains, the Arab uprising, you know, uh, the problem in Iraq, the problem in, you know, uh, Tibet and so many places. That's okay. That's all right, right? And in journalism, what we also do is we say bad news is good news. That is how we are trained. So we talk about deaths. We talk about disasters. We talk about, you know, uh, people killing people. Uh, we talk about violence. And as we report about violence and these things, we become the heroes. Journalists like, you know, reporting from the front line. It sounds so great, you know. And then you, you produce brilliant report. That is your responsibility. That's fine. It sounds great. But all the time doing that, what journalism has achieved? That is, that is the way I have been questioning. I have been a political journalist throughout my career as well. But lately, I have been questioning what is the point of it? Because if you ask a journalist or an academic of mass communication or journalism about the core value of journalism, then everyone would say that the core value of journalism is public service. But the kind of journalism we are doing, has it actually served the public? People might say yes, because we have informed them. We have, uh, you know, we have talked about accountability. We have made, you know, corrupt politicians accountable. We have helped restore democracies in different places. But let's see things in totality. In totality, the gap between the rich and poor is increasing. The sense of insecurity in the world is increasing. The sense of violence is increasing. Environmental degradation is increasing. 2% 2 of the richest people on Earth accumulate 40% of the wealth. And 1% of the wealth, just 1% of the wealth, is shared by the 50% poorest people in the world. 
Is that fair? When we, okay, if you come to Germany, it is a developed country, we might say that, you know, we can talk about political rights, we can say that what journalism is doing good. If you go to America, if you go to the UK, that's fine. But the world is re really big, and there are lots of people who are suffering. And has journalism, which has so much power and so much access, such a huge access to the public, done to rectify these fundamental problems in the world? My conclusion is it could have done more, it hasn't done enough. So what I'm saying at the moment is you can have political, if you can have political journalism, if you can have economic journalism, if you can have entertainment journalism, if you can have, you know, environmental journalism and sports journalism, why can't you have something called philanthropic journalism? And by philanthropic journalism, what I mean is in traditional journalism, what we do is if, you know, students in a uh, remote part of Ethiopia are studying under a shade of a tree because they don't have a classroom. And as a journalist, I see that, and I have a camera, I take a picture, and I publish it in a newspaper. And I think I have done my job because I brought that into the public domain so that the attention of the government could be drawn. But actually, will it serve the problem of those students or the school? Most of the time, it doesn't. That is the reason the concept of development journalism came in the 1960s, or it was 1970s, right? The idea was to raise issues which are directly related to development so that the attention of the authorities could be drawn to those issues and the, those issues could be resolved. And then that was called development journalism. That was a step ahead of traditional journalism. And in 1990s, you know, some academics in the U.S. came up with the idea of public journalism. And they said that people who are suffering a certain situation, certain problem, should be engaged themselves in resolving those issues, and journalism should provide a forum for them. And that was called public journalism. And that was another step ahead. But still, that wasn't enough. My feeling is journalism has always been just a catalyst of conversation and not a catalyst of change. And journalism has the power to be a catalyst of change. And by that, what I mean is, if you report about a school students studying under a shade of a tree, you can publish the photo, you can write a story, but at the same time, you can add three or four sentences saying that to build a school classroom for these 100 or so students, it will cost maybe 5,000 euros. And if someone is interested to help, you can contact the school board on this number. You can put that information. And it, that doesn't you know, violate the journalistic principle according to my opinion, right? What will that do is you raise the issue, but at the same time, you help, you show the way to resolve that problem as well. And if you do that, lots of schools would be built. For example, there are over 300 FM stations operating in Nepal. And there are 30,000 public schools in Nepal. And out of 30,000 public schools, only about 5,000 schools have library, and 25,000 schools don't have any libraries. For example, if one FM station in a year you know, does an appeal saying that in our target area, there is a school, it doesn't have a library. To build a library, it costs about 3,000, you know, euros. And in one year, we want to raise 3,000 euros and build a library. If it says that, I'm sure it can raise that money because people want to support, you know, a school or a library in their community and some radio is taking an initiative, it will raise its profile as well. If one station does that, 300 FM stations can build 300 libraries in a year. And how come that is not the task of journalism? How come that is not the task of media? That is what I, I question. And I think if media starts working along those lines, Lots of good things that can happen as we report about bad things. So that is 
what philanthropic journalism is. Okay. Okay, uh, Mr. Mishra, I thank you for this interview. I wish you the best of luck with uh, raising more funds throughout Europe. You're traveling to Portugal tomorrow. Um, wish you the best of luck with your organization. And um, thanks for coming. And, and thank you about. so much for your, for your television station and to yourself for inviting me and allowing me to share this very personal opinion about you know charity and journalism and various other things thank well, you very uh, much thank you thank you